The NanoGrav 15-year data set is about to be released next week on June 29th, which is when this will come out. And since I don't think we explicitly mentioned the name NanoGrav in the first part of this talk, maybe we can just start by saying quickly what the organization is and does. So NanoGrav is a pulsar timing array experiment. And what we do is that we monitor about 68 millisecond pulsars. So these pulsars are nature's almost perfect clocks. In fact, they used to be better at keeping time than atomic clocks, but in 2012, atomic clocks got better. Um, but basically, they can keep track of time up until about 100 nanoseconds over a decade. So they really are fabulous clocks. So it makes them perfect, natural gravitational wave detectors since gravitational waves change the distances between objects. So if you're sitting your watch by these pulsars and their pulse is coming in, and then your signal started arriving early and then arriving late, it could be because there's a gravitational wave that's transiting through the galaxy that's changing the distances between objects. So the pulsars come a little bit closer and they get moved a little bit further away and then come closer again. And so your pulsar pulses arrive early and then late and then early. And this is a way of looking for these very low frequency gravitational waves. We believe that the source of these gravitational waves are supermassive black hole binary systems. But we're going to need a few more years of data to know concretely that that's what's sourcing these gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. And so the new data suggests a few things. But first off, just what is the difference between this data and the data we had in the first part of this conversation? So what, what is new now? that's being released. So what's new in this new data set that just came out is the fact that there's now evidence for the full gravitational wave signature that we were looking for. So the previous data set had evidence for some amplitude of a gravitational wave background that's consistent with models that we, that we created. However, we were missing part of the signal to know concretely that the signal comes from gravitational waves. And that was this Hellings and Downs curve. And so what that is, is that it's a distinctive shape that comes out when you cross correlate all of the pulsar data. So briefly, what, you know, many of us that have done, that have done STEM degrees have had a whole bunch, you know, of data streams to analyze. And you're looking for something that's common in all of these data streams. And so each piece of data is going to have a small piece of signal, but a lot of noise. And the way that you get at the signal is by, you know, smashing together all of these different pieces of data and seeing like what the common thing is between them. Because every time you do this cross correlation search, only the signal stands out. So the more data you have, the more signal you get and the less noise you get because the signal uh, is common and the noise is not common. So the more common signal you have, the stronger your detection will be. So in this data set, we have more pulsars with longer time spans. And so we've increased the signal. And now we can see this cross-correlation term in all of the pulsars. So we expect not only pulsars to have a common amplitude of the gravitational wave background that's manifesting in all of them, but they should also have a distinct correlation term that's a function only of the angle that separates the pulsars. So if pulsars are close together on the sky, they have a very strong correlation induced by the gravitational wave background. And as they separate, that correlation becomes weaker. Then they become anti-correlated and then they become positively correlated again because the nature of gravitational waves stretches and squashes space time like this. So it, became, it can become you know, positively correlated, negatively correlated, positively And so the major finding here now is that there is much firmer evidence for this gravitational wave background than there was before. There's the first evidence ever that there's a gravitational wave background. Before we had something that looked very interesting, but we needed to be really sure that what it was was gravitational waves. And without having the cross correlation terms between pulsar pairs, that might have been some sort of you know, dust or other kind of noise that was correlated between the pulsars, it would have been really unlikely, but it was still a possibility. So we had to be really, really sure 
that what we were seeing was gravitational waves. And now that we've seen this Hellings and Downs curve or these cross correlation terms, now we're really confident to say that what we found is definitely evidence for a gravitational wave background. Sure. And I saw in one of the preprints that accompanies the data release that the signal also bears some relation or potential relation to other uh, cosmological creatures and possibilities beyond the supermassive black hole binaries. In particular, I think some of the things that were mentioned were uh, cosmic inflation, uh, scalar induced gravitational waves, uh, first order phase transitions, uh, do domain walls, and then cosmic strings. We actually talked about those in the first part of our episode, so we don't need to uh, get into those again. But what is like what credence do you have that this is all coming from supermassive black holes? And what are some of these other possibilities that I just mentioned? And how likely is it that they're contributing to this uh, gravitational wave background? Right. So right now I kind of feel like Mulder from the X-Files. I want to <laughs> believe that it's all from You want to believe in which one? Holes. I want to believe it's all supermassive black holes. Um, that would be super exciting. Some of the models that I came up with for the gravitational wave background based on supermassive black holes only predict the amplitude to be half of what we've measured. So it's super exciting that now we're learning something. We're learning that there's potentially more supermassive black hole binary, that those are more massive than we thought that they were. Perhaps they merge more often than we thought that they did. So we can learn a ton of stuff from you know comparing our theories to these measurements with the data. But it might not all be supermassive black holes. As you said, there's a whole slew of other cosmological sources of gravitational waves. And right now, the signature of all of those sources is very, very similar to the supermassive black hole signature. Those signatures manifest in how the amplitude of the background changes as a function of gravitational wave frequency. And right now, that change, there's a, a kind of slope of the line that joins together all of these different frequencies. And right now, all of those slopes are predicted to be about minus one. For supermassive black holes, it's minus two thirds. For a primordial background, it's minus one. And for cosmic strings, it's minus seven eighths. And so right now, it's basically all minus one with big fat error bars. And so until those error bars come down, we won't really be able to tell what exactly is sourcing this gravitational wave background. We know that it exists and that any one of those sources can create this Hellings and Downs curve. But we're going to need some more years of data and more careful analysis to try to tease apart different contributions from different sources. And another source that we haven't talked about is, of course, intrinsic noise in the pulsars themselves. That might also be contributing a small part to this. We know for sure that that's not dominating our signal because we can see the Hellings and Downs curve. And that is that can only be made from gravitational waves. And this is also why we didn't proclaim evidence for the gravitational wave background beforehand, because we didn't have that part of the puzzle. We didn't see that part of the signal. But now that we do, we know that this amplitude that we've seen that goes together with the Hellings and Downs curve, we know that that has to be largely astrophysical or cosmological and not instrumental, but taking apart the signal that we've measured and really, you know, now fine tuning things to try to figure out exactly what's what is the next step. Hmm. And so quite broadly, then assuming that the source of the gravitational wave background is as you want to believe for now, supermassive black holes. What does this new evidence then tell us about their nature or that of the universe in general? And I think in the first part of this conversation, we went into some of these possibilities in depth, but that's why I say so more broadly now. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we know now, if the source really is supermassive black holes, is that they merge. And this was a huge open question in the field before. Do supermassive black holes merge? In fact, there were some papers in the 80s which claimed that they didn't merge at all. And so it's really important to be able to say at a zero order level, supermassive black holes merge. 
And so that's also important for understanding how the universe works. Because if you go back to the beginning of the universe, we believe that, you know, black holes seed in galaxies, galaxies merge, their supermassive black holes merge, and that, you know, all of the galaxies grow by merging. And so a consequence of that is that their supermassive black hole should be merging. And some of those supermassive black holes are big enough to create this gravitation wave background. So it's this long sought after additional evidence that the universe works in this way, that, you know, galaxies grow by merging with other galaxies. We've seen observational evidence through Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope, lots of other different telescopes that you can actually see snapshots of galaxies in the process of merging. Then this is the final piece of the puzzle that's been missing. It's what happens to the supermassive black hole. Do they hang out a few light years apart forever, never quite merging, or do they actually get together and grow the mergers? Hmm. And then lastly, two things that you've already touched on this a little bit, but one, what is the future of nanograv's research and then what is the future of the the theoreticians parsing of that research so the future right now is everything this is just the beginning of this new window of observation on the universe with the evidence for the gravitational wave background that we have now we expect to make a five sigma detection uh, right now we have between three and four sigma. So five sigma is only a few years away and we'll be able to make that, you know, concrete detection. Maybe and we should say what, that, the, we'll what the sigmas to... are for those who don't know. Sure. So a uh, three sigma detection has the false alarm probability of something like one in a thousand years. So there's a chance of one in a thousand that this is just a random configuration of data that looks a heck of a lot like a gravitational wave background. Uh, and so that's good enough for me, but in particle physics, uh, they have much stricter definitions of what we call detection. Um, and that's a whole other, almost like philosophy of science conversation is, you know, like, what would you believe? Because it really comes down to what different scientists believe in, like what their personal threshold for believing a detection is. So once we do have this stronger detection, which will come with a few more years of data and more pulsars, then we can start making maps of the gravitational wave background. And then we can start analyzing those maps and looking for, you know, weird and wonderful things. And this is where the theorists can really go crazy, right? Like what happens if you look at a map of the gravitational wave background and you see a hot spot of gravitational waves, and then you look at that part of the sky with your telescope and there's no galaxies there. Right. So what what on earth is that? Do you have like rogue supermassive black holes? Or is it some sort of weird cosmic string event coming from that part of the of the universe like these are all questions that i think we're going to have to take really seriously and this is where the theoreticians really you know start turning things up to 11 we get to get really really creative with different models of of gravitational wave emission in the universe and and what could be sourcing this background and and also what's next 